You can be seated. Turn to Micah. <clears throat> Micah lived in Israel or Judah? Judah. Judah, which it, Judah is the northern or the southern kingdom? Southern. southern kingdom, right. The two, Judah and Benjamin, and had Levi, Levi was also pretty big in there. Uh, he prophesied primarily to Judah as well. He Now, some of it to Israel, the northern kingdom, because he lived in a time when uh, the northern kingdom of Israel still hadn't fallen. The northern kingdom would fall during Micah's time of pro prophesying, but the southern kingdom would fall years after he had died. Now, last week we were in Micah 4, and uh, if you remember as we went through that, it's uh, 13 verses, and its primary focus, you remember what the primary focus, prophetically speaking, is of Micah 4? Restoration, specifically during what time period? The second coming, after the second coming. Right? After the second coming, talking about the millennial reign of Christ. And, and you look and you see that all throughout this. And, uh, and, and all of the, many of the prophecies of, of chapter 4 are, are unfulfilled even yet. Uh, but this evening, Micah is going to, he's going to kind of have a split prophecy. Some of what he's talking about will be what we look back now and we see it as history. It's going to be soon fulfilled prophecy, short-term prophecy. Others are going to also, just as in chapter 4, they're going to look far, far ahead into what we're still looking at as far as unfulfilled prophecy, speaking of the millennium. And he starts out with prophesied humiliation. Take a look at verse 1 of chapter 5. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. So when he says to gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops, he is essentially calling for the for the people of, of Israel or Judah, as we'll see in just a moment, he's calling for them to mobilize in, in armed conflict, for them to prepare for armed conflict or prepare for war. This verse, I, I believe, is referring to the siege of Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was besieged several times, not not just by the Babylonians. And, and as we go here, I'll, I'll give you both sides of this argument and we'll, we'll talk through it a little bit. When he speaks about the judge, he says, uh, the, second, the, the last part of verse 1, he says, They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. Now, was Israel ruled by judges during the time of Micah? No. No. No, who, what, were, what was Israel in the time of Micah? It was a, yeah, it was, a, it was a monarchy. It was ruled by kings. So Israel and Judah, both ruled by kings. And so when we speak of this judge, think of it more as the office, which would have been filled not by a judge like Samson or Barak or Gideon, but this would have been the office, the high office, so think of the king. So essentially, he's saying they shall smite the king of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. So that, that judging there has to do with the office or the position of the one who judges, the highest office in the land. Now, there are, are two different <clears throat> thoughts as to what this is talking about, verse, verse 1 of chapter 5. Some believe that it's talking about Hezekiah's siege by Sennacherib. In 2 Kings chapter 19. Now, if that is what it's talking about, then that means that this prophecy was fulfilled during Micah's lifetime. Because Micah was contemporary. He prophesied during the reign of Hezekiah. Now, in 2 Kings chapter 19, Sennacherib was, do you remember what uh, nationality Sennacherib was? He was a Syrian, okay? Now, remember, he's surrounding Judah. Who had taken over, who would take over Israel? Assyria. So Assyria, when they came down, they captured Israel, the northern kingdom. They took over Samaria. And then they tried to expand their conquest. 
and they came down and they surrounded Jerusalem. So Sennacherib in 2 Kings chapter 19 comes down and he surrounds Jerusalem and he's got them hopelessly outnumbered and it is truly an end of, of the world situation for Jerusalem. And uh, Sennacherib writes uh, a letter and he's, he's defying God and blaspheming God. I, and I mentioned this before, but Hezekiah takes the letter and he goes into the temple and he spreads the letter out and he says, God, you see what they're saying about you? Do something, please. And he, he, he gets right and, and God does. God answers Hezekiah's prayer. And the angel of the Lord comes down, and in one night, he kills 185,000 of the Assyrians who are surrounding Jerusalem. And so the, the few who are left pack up and go home. And, uh, and Sennacherib leaves in shame. This appears to me to be more of a reproach on the Assyrians than the Israelites in 2 Kings 19. Which if you look in verse 1 here of Micah... Uh, it's he's saying that they will smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. That's a high insult in this culture. You know, to slap somebody, if if you're if you're trying to get on somebody's last last nerve and you you punch them in the shoulder, they're gonna they're gonna wave that off. You slap them in the face, and it, it, it's a higher insult even in our culture. And when they're talking about this, he's gonna smite him with a rod. On the cheek. It's a high insult. So for that reason, I don't think this is talking about Sennacherib. I don't think this is talking about 2 Kings 19. I think that this is talking about Zedekiah's defeat and humiliation by the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar. When Jerusalem did fall, I think, so that would put Micah's prophecy beyond his lifetime. He's prophesying of something yet to come. In 2 Kings 24, we read about the fall of Judah to the armies of Babylon. Zedekiah had many humiliations piled upon him. Not, not just a, a symbolic slap on the, on the cheek. Uh, he had his sons were murdered before his eyes, and then they blinded him immediately after. So he was, he was very definitely humiliated. And I believe that fits a lot better with Micah 5.1. As far as the prophesied humiliation, yes. When you talk about these two, are you talking about the he in verse in verse one? You're, you're deciding and trying to say who, which one of these? When you when you when I ask yes. who is the he in verse one? He, that's what you're talking. Yes, about. he hath laid siege against us. Us talking about Judah. He being, I believe, the Babylonians because it fits, where the Assyrians don't fit, and the time frame doesn't fit. Okay, So Micah is talking down the road because the Babylonians would come after the death of Micah. So yes, the he is who we're talking about, the he being the Assyrians. Yep. So then we come to a prophet. First we have prophesied humiliation. Then we come to verse 2, and we have prophesied deliverance long-range deliverance, he says. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now, if verse 1 looks ahead to the destruction of Jerusalem, verse 2 looks beyond, much beyond, to the time of Christ, to the coming of the promised one. And we know this to be, to be true because in Matthew chapter 2, the wise men came to Jerusalem and they asked Herod, where is he that was born king of the Jews? And, and Herod, this would be Herod the Great, looks at his son, Herod Antipas, who was not a baby, he was a full, a full grown man, and he's, he says uh, within himself and probably to his closest advisors, who, who are they talking about? Some king being born in, in Israel? No, there's no king born. And so Herod goes and he, he asked the wise men in Matthew chapter 2, verse 4. And, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, 
Micah, Micah 5, 2, thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So we know the fulfillment of this prophecy. It's looking forward to Christ. It's looking forward to the, the promised one, the Messiah, the one who would come in fulfillment of of the promises that God had made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to David, to Solomon, all of those promises fulfilled in Christ's first coming, which was prophesied here in verse 2. Then we come to verse 3. Now, it's interesting because if, if we were looking at, at Micah, Sometimes looking at where a prophecy is used in the New Testament shines a whole lot more light than we can get out of anything else in the book. Because sometimes God's fulfillment of, a, of an Old Testament prophecy it seems very, very shadowy to us. It's, it's difficult for us to understand. So that's why when we see pro prophecy in the Old Testament, interpret it in the light of the whole Bible, which is what we do here in verse 2. So, prophesied humiliation of the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. Then, prophesied deliverance, the arrival of the promised one in, in Jesus, the Messiah, who would come and be born in Bethlehem of Judea. And then we have the return of a remnant that's prophesied in verse 3. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought, brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Now, if, I'm, if you have questions, please stop me. But we're, we're just going through and trying to make it so that when we read Micah, it makes sense, right? So, again, the commentators are very, they disagree on, on verse 3 here. Some believe that this refers to the birth of Christ. Therefore, he, God, will give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. In light of verse 2, who, who do you think they think she that travaileth is? Mary. Mary, right? They, so they're saying, well, God's going to hold back, and then, and then when Mary has delivered, then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. And there are some things. Now, Israel was an occupied land at the time of Christ's birth. But I, I would not hold to this, this line of thinking, and I'll explain why. But first, let me give you the other line of thinking. Others who study this passage believe it speaks of the end of times. And I believe that that is a, is a truer, and it makes a little bit more sense. Because of their rejection of Christ, Israel was dispersed. Therefore, will he give them up? And he did. Israel, in 70 A.D., was given up, and they, they exploded across the world in the, in the dispersal or the diaspora. Israel will go through a period of travail, okay, before the remnant is saved. I believe that the period of travail would be synonymous with the time of Jacob's trouble, which would be the tribulation period, because they've gone out, he's given them up, but obviously we know that God hasn't set aside Israel. Israel's still on God's heart. And he'll draw them back after this travail. Travail. Occupied travail. Travail would mean labor pains. So he's speaking in hyperbole here. He says that uh, he, he's, he's going to give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Making this an end times prophecy, something that takes place after the second coming. So let me lay it out here for you just a little bit, okay? Here we have Israel rejects Christ, okay? 30 AD approximately, okay? Israel lives the time of the, the start of the church, all of this that's going on. You have Peter and James and John and all of these and Paul are spreading the church, okay? And then in 70 AD, that's when the, the Jews revolted in a big way against Rome. And Rome came and crushed them. Rome, that's when Herod's temple was destroyed. That was the last time that the Jews had a temple on the Holy Mount. Okay? So they were taken. 
Titus killed countless thousands of them, crucified them for miles on the sides of the roads coming and going from Jerusalem. And then he, the, the Jews who were left went out across the world. So in, in accordance with the first part of verse 3, therefore will he give them up. So they, they, they go everywhere. And, and they trickled back into Jerusalem. In 1948, they came back and the state of Israel formed again, right? But then there's going to be a time of tremendous travail. Okay, so now we're, now we're prophetic even to us. And, and there's going to be a time of trouble, last seven years. At which time, when they're done with that travail, because there's no church, the church is raptured, Israel's left, they go through seven years of trouble, and then there is what we read here at the end of this verse, then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Israel, now they get the land. Israel will take a ruling position among the nations of the world. The reason why this makes sense as the interpretation of this passage is because of what comes next. If we look at this and we understand this not as talking about the birth of Jesus, but as talking about the days after the second coming during the millennial reign of Christ, it makes a whole lot more sense. Any questions? Have I lost you? Following along? Okay. <clears throat> then take a look at verse 4. Verse 4 looks forward to the time when Christ is going to reign from Jerusalem. Verse 4. And he, the same he as in verse 3, and he, speaking of Christ, shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide. Israel's in the land. Who's going to kick Israel out of the land during the millennium? No one. Nobody. Why? Because Christ is reigning. There's nobody. Nobody's going to have the muscle to come and tell Israel to do anything. Because what? Israel's in submission to the Lord. Israel's in submission to the Lord. Yeah. And so now nobody's going to come and pick on Israel. Why? Because Jesus is reigning in Jerusalem right there, sitting on that throne. Okay? It'll be a physical, literal reign, which makes this uh, make a lot of sense. The Messiah, here pictured as the shepherd of his people in their homeland, where they will remain. No one gets to pick on Israel. Nobody, when the shepherd is standing in his sheepfold, no animal is going to come up and try to, to mess with the sheep. When Jesus is sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem, nobody's going to try to mess with Israel. They stay away. Verse 5. And this man shall be the peace. Huh. That, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? This man shall be the peace. When the Assyrian shall come into our land, and when he shall tread in our palaces, then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. Now, you see the Assyrians here, and you maybe you're thinking, well, that kind of doesn't sound like what we were talking about in verse 2, because we, we've already established that we're talking about the Babylonians. Well, I, I believe, and, and I, I think we can back it up from Scripture, when the Assyrians are mentioned here, it's as a type. Let me explain. The Assyrians were the enemy of the time. Okay? When Micah was talking, the Assyrians were, were at the gates. The Assyrians were causing all sorts of trouble. The Assyrians were raiding into Israel. They were raiding into Judah. And so when he talks about the Assyrians, they're the enemy of the time. They're the, they're the, big, they're the big bad wolf who live in the time of Micah. The Assyrians would not be the ones who would ultimately capture Judah. The Babylonians would capture Judah in 586, considerably later than the Assyrians. Incidentally, the Babylonians would capture Assyria, and then they would capture Judah. So Babylon was so much bigger than, than Assyria or Judah, but they took over. Since the context of this verse is referring to the millennium, Assyria is likely used generically for whoever the enemy of that day is. Who, will, who won't like Israel during the millennium? We, we don't know. Because unsaved people, during unsaved people, there will be people who won't like Israel. There have always been people who don't like Israel. That will be the same even in this day. There will be loser 
Yeah, they're in a, they're, you would think that at the end of the tribulation, after watching Armageddon happen, you would think that people would kind of get it in their heads. Hey, pick it on Israel. Really not a good position to take. And yet they do. It's, it is worthy of note that the enemies of Israel may be the descendants of the Assyrians, even at the end of the millennium. That, that would work. That would make sense. The, the descendants of the Assyrians... Those that remain, even, I mean, there are descendants of Assyrians today, and so the, the descendants of the Assyrians who lived then, perhaps that would be an understanding that we could take. Regardless of their identity, of their, uh, regardless of the identity of their enemies, who's going to win the fight? Jesus and Christ. Yeah, Jesus and Christ. Yeah, Jesus and Israel. There's, there's not going to be any, there's not going to be a, any close fights. Now, uh, I'm going to read just a, a, a portion of, of one of the books that I was studying in preparation for this. When you read um, Seven Shepherds and Eight Principal Men, let me read to you from Believer's Bible Commentary, very, a very brief quote. It says, Seven shepherds and eight principal men should not be taken to mean that there would literally be only 15 leaders raised up to withstand the Assyrian. When one number is followed by the next highest number in a poetic framework, the meaning is that there is an adequate or complete number of whatever occurs in the context. Does that make sense? Here's, here's what he said. He says... Seven shepherds, eight principal men, should not be taken to mean there would only literally be 15 leaders raised up to withstand the Assyrian. When one number is followed by the next highest number in a poetic framework, the meaning is that there is an adequate or complete number of whatever occurs in the text. Here's, here's how we would say that. Somebody says, how many people are there going to be at the, at the meeting? All 1415? 15? Does that mean that there are going to be 15 people or 14 people? No, that means you're giving an approximate number, and that's what this, it's, it's kind of a grammatical device that's used. When he says there will be seven and eight, it's like saying a 14 or 15, kind of a, in this type of a context. It happens several other times throughout the Bible. It happens in the book of Job, happens in Proverbs, happens in Psalms, any of the prophetic books of the Bible. This is a, is a device that's used where they say 7, 8, you know, 14, 15 is kind of an equivalent here. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. Have I lost you, Andy? <laughs> you think that they'll have to defend themselves in any way during the land? Do I think that Israel will have to de defend themselves? N not, not in any real sense because they'll have Christ defending them in, in very... In a very literal form, Christ will be defended. What What did you say? Yeah, it just seems to be a memory thing. Yes. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so thus far, we start out verse one, prophesying the humiliation, the fall of Judah, the fall of Jerusalem. We prophesy deliverance, speaking of the coming of Christ. Then we're talking about the end in the millennium, the return of a remnant in verses uh, three down through verse 5. Then we come to verse 6. We're still talking about the millennium. They're going to take the battle to the enemy in verse 6. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod and the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our borders. Now remember, when we're using the word Assyrian, we're talking about a generic enemy. And one reason that should further solidify that position is when he talks about Nimrod. Where was Nimrod? Long dead. Long dead. Like, how, how long ago was Nimrod? Like in Genesis. Genesis 10. <laughs> yeah. Long time. Way at the beginning. Nimrod was the one who led the sons of Noah, and they, they gathered around on the plains of Shinar and built the Tower of Babel, right? That was Nimrod. So when we're talking about the Assyrians and Nimrod, Babel eventually would, would morph into Babel on. And so he's, he's speaking generically. The Assyrians, the bad guys, the descendants of Nimrod, the Babylonians, the two prevailing world powers at this time. 
the enemies of Israel thought they could win over a, a small remnant. How, how big is Israel now? Not huge. Not huge. But several million. How big will Israel be at the end of the tribulation? Very few. Very few. We're talking a, a remnant of people who are left. And the nations of the world who, who really got hooked at the Battle of Armageddon, they say, well, this, this could be our chance. There's so few of them left. We could, we could just barely do anything, and we could just wipe Israel off the map. And it's not going to work. Israel will, will defend themselves and will, according to this, they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword. Meaning, the people who attack them will get beat back all the way to their house. And Israel will just keep following. Verse 7. The remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord. As showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man nor waiteth for the sons of men. Israel, under the rule of the Messiah during the millennium, will be elevated among the nations of the world. Israel's the top. Right, right now, you could, you could have a debate as to who the world superpower is. I, I think it's still America, okay? But China's right there nipping at our heels, and Russia's trying to, trying to get into that position. There's, there's that, that vying for the top spot. Who's going to be the, the top nation during the millennium? Israel. Why? Because God says, and because who's there? Jesus is in Israel, okay? He's, he's right there. He's sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. So Israel's the top spot. They are the, the, they're elevated among the nations of the world. When it says that they will be as a dew from the Lord, that whole region, the region of Israel, even right now, depends heavily on the daily dew during the dry season because they don't get rain for a long period of time. But the presence of Israel will be a blessing to many. People, there will be those, as there have always been, who hate Israel, who desire to destroy her. But Israel, by and large, will be a blessing to the nations of the world. Verse 8. And the remnant of Jacob. Who's that talking about? Jews. Jews. Israel. The remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people, as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep. <laughs> okay, so real quick, just to make sense of the illustration that God uses, Israel is going to be among the Gentiles and among the, the, the nations. They're going to be as a lion among the beasts of the forest. Okay. The lion is called the king of beasts, right? Why? Top dog. Top of the food chain, most mostly, right? And it says, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep. How's that work out? You put a lion in with your sheep. It doesn't work out well, right? So just following the illustration that God uses, he says Israel is going to be like this. Israel is going to be the top of the food chain. Israel among the nations is going to be like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Verse 9, thine hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. Millennial Israel will be a blessing to those who mean to do her well. Like the dew of heaven. She'll be Israel, to have a, a good relationship with Israel, God promised Abraham. He said, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, verse 8 and 9. If you bless Israel, they'll be like the morning dew. If you curse Israel, they'll be like a lion in the middle of the sheep. The church people will all come back to Christ. Yes. Because they'll be in Israel. It will all be in Israel. Legion or how do I mean? I think, I think scattered I think scattered across okay. the globe because the Bible talks about our, our ruling and reigning with Christ. And I think that there will be there will be an oversight. The the believers who come down under Christ, I, I think according to not this passage, but other prophetic passages will receive some 
managerial duties on earth where they will be able to oversee portions of, of yeah, earth. Yeah, I've heard that. But when it talks about nations, so there's going to be countries all over the world, mm -hmm. and they're going to come against them. So uh, they're not the top people in a lot of countries that are going to land there, but, but there's going to be these countries that are going to well, come to war against them. Yeah, there will there will be some, and you know, could could be, and often it is even today. You know, right now is Lebanon at war with Israel? Yes. Not Lebanon though. Who is at war with Israel? Hamas. And where is Hamas? Well, Hamas is in Lebanon. So there's there's that tension. It's not necessarily between the nations. You know, right now. Uh, there's good diplomatic relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia. They, they get along reasonably well. But there are a lot of people in Saudi Arabia who hate Israel because of their religious position. So it may not be so much their, their nation as it is their faction within the nation. Yeah. Notice the difference here real quick. Between Israel and verse 1, what's happening to Israel's king in verse 1 of chapter 5? getting slapped in the face. He's getting humiliated in front of everybody. What's happening with Israel here in verses 8 and 9? They're the absolute top of the food chain. No, no one's slapping Israel around anymore. Why? Well, because, because Christ is there. He's ruling with a rod of iron. What's the difference between verse 1 and verse 8 and 9? Christ. The difference is their relationship with Christ. What happened to Israel in AD 70? General Titus, the Romans came in and ran roughshod over them. Crucified thousands of them. Blew them all over the then known world. Won't happen in this day. Why? All because of their relationship to Christ. They rejected Christ out of hand. They suffered for it. They, they will continue to suffer for it. Israel... In 2021, as we sit here tonight, Israel is suffering the consequences of rejecting the Messiah. They will suffer those consequences until Jesus comes back and they finally accept him. But when they accept him, everything changes. Everything changes. They go from being this little backwater nation on the, on the shore of the Mediterranean to being the absolute dominant power in global politics. They will be all there is because of Christ. It all comes down to what they do with Christ. The last verses here of chapter 5 we can deal with kind of as a block. Take a look at verse 10 and we'll read. And it shall come to pass in that day. What day are we talking about? The millennium. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee. I will destroy thy chariots. I will cut off the cities of thy land and throw down all thy strongholds. I will cut off witchcrafts out of thine hand, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Thy graven images also will I cut off. Thy standing images out of the midst of thee. Thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands, and I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee, so I will destroy thy cities. And I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. Who's the hero of Israel's story? Christ. 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 All Christ. How, how much, now, at this time, let's, let's back up and let's get the big picture view here real quick. Micah's, Micah's the one saying all this. When Micah is saying all this, what is, is, is Israel depending on God? Or is Israel kind of depending on, well, they've got their false gods. There's, there are statues all around. There are their fenced cities that we've already talked about that would get overrun. There's, they're depending on lots of things other than God. They're depending on horses and chariots. They're depending on walled, uh, walled cities. They're depending on, on idolatry and the black arts when it talks about soothsayers and fortune tellers. They're depending on all of this. And these verses right here, God takes in verses 10 through 15, he takes and strips away everything but him. So who, you're going you're gonna to depend on your, on your walled cities? They're gone. What, what's left at the end of the tribulation? What hope does Israel have at the end of the tribulation? Jesus is it. 
They're at, they're at the end. They're in a corner. The nations of the world all have their guns pointed at Israel, and they, they've had everything stripped away, and they, they look up, and Jesus rides in out of the clouds and delivers them, and they realize this is the Messiah, and national Israel turns to the Messiah. Do you, do you think this is the end of the tribulation versus the end of the thousand years? This would be the, the beginning. Because Israel won't, Israel won't suffer these things at the end of the millennium. It would suffer. It would have these things going into it. This, this is the lead up that puts them in the position where they can receive the blessings of God. So what, what makes it you think that it's Israel instead of the rest of the world that it's talking about here? Because the, the prophecy is to Judah, is to Israel. Mike, Micah is the one saying this, and he's not giving this prophecy to the nations of the world. Look at verse 15. He's, he's speaking, he says, if you look in verse 10, he says, And it shall come to pass, and that day saith the Lord, that I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee. And then in verse 15, and I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen. He doesn't say I will execute vengeance and anger upon thee, because he's not talking to the heathen. He's talking to Israel. The, the pronoun changes there between the two. Do, do you see what I, I mean? I would just, I would just for some reason, we got to. We would turn to the end of the thousand years the big war when he was talking about taking out. Know. I, I I think it fits it fits much better into what we know of, of prophecy when we say God's doing this to Israel and it pulls them to the point Israel's at they're they're on the bottom. There's nowhere to look but up. They look up and there's Jesus. And they turn to him. And what does he do to the heathen? Executes vengeance upon them. Like they've never heard. Psalm 20 verse 7 says. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. When will Israel ultimately learn that lesson? At this time. When they finally realize. It's, it's not because we have fenced cities. It's not because of our idols. It's not because of anything. It's just, it's just Jesus. It's just Christ. Again, what made the difference in Israel's situation between verse 1 and verse 15? Their relationship with Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Eventually, Israel will learn this lesson. Who's the hero of Israel's story? On, only Christ. Only Christ. Who's the hero of yours? Should, should be Jesus, right? When you're the hero of your story, there's a problem. <laughs> Psalm 118, verse 8. It's the, the, sent, the, the middle verse of the Bible. If you count from both ends, it's Psalm 118, 8. And it says, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. When will Israel finally learn that lesson? When all of this happens. And when they place their confidence in someone other than a man. But that includes us too. It's, it's better for us to put trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. In our efforts to be self-made people, we must not forget the importance of our relationship with Christ. I don't know who it was who said it. He said, a self-made man is a double disaster. There's a lot of truth to that. Be someone who, who looks to Christ. Any questions that you have as it relates to Micah 5? Kind of kind of deep. <laughs> I know, but Trying to act, even right now, they're trying to act in like a one-world government eventually. Yep. God's kind of a one-world government guy too, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> the real one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The I mean, only man, man is trying to do that on their own now, and actually, they're going to try and fail. Of course, they always do. They always, everything they always that, do. Everything that God has, man has counterfeit for. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I would encourage you, go home, read Micah 5 again, and just kind of get it in mind what, what, we're, what we're talking about. And, and that can help. If you have questions, I'd love to, I'd love to help talk with you. I'd love to help, help it. My, again, my goal in this study through Micah is so that when somebody says, turn to Micah, it's not, I know that's a book in the Old Testament, but I have no idea what it says. We want it so that it makes a little bit more sense. So 